The battlefield promotion. It was a phrase I'd never given much thought to until it was applied to me a few months ago. A friend used it to describe how I became the host of Livewire. When the show started nine years ago, I was head writer and a member of the sketch comedy troupe Faces for Radio Theater. We were just a young, scrappy show that recorded an hour-long show once a month that aired on our local NPR affiliate, OPB. Our host was Rob Sample, and he was the perfect host. He was smooth and professional and very radio-friendly. But Rob had a full-time job that conflicted with the show. Uh, I <laughs> didn't. So I was given the aforementioned battlefield promotion. Uh, a battlefield promotion is what happens in combat when a soldier does something so heroic that he or she is given a promotion on the spot, no red tape required. But it is also used in the business world to describe someone who is given a promotion in an emergency situation and may not have the means to handle it yet. <laughs> Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't offended by the characterization because at the time, I was not like Rob, a smooth, confident pro with just the silky voice one needs for a career in radio. I was, in fact, an awkward, insecure amateur with just the rough voice needed for a career in either the phlebotomy or small engine repair fields. <laughs> uh, but I was lucky in that I had pr producers who were willing to allow me to grow with the show and eventually I found my footing. It also didn't hurt that with hosts like Ira Glass, Robert Krolwich, and Click and Clack, awkward was totally in. And I was gonna ride that nerd wave all the way into the sunny shores of Dork City, USA. And over the years, hosting the show meant meeting and talking to some of my heroes. John Hodgman, Susan Orlean, Mike Berbiglia, even cartoonist Linda Berry, who is the only person I've written a fan letter to in my life. I didn't even write a fan letter to Sean Cassidy, and I had his picture stuck up in the slats of my canopy bed so that I could look at it before falling asleep every night, which explains a lot about my sleep problems that I still have. Um, and as a writer, I can never put into words what it meant meeting the extraordinary and extraordinarily kind writer David Rakoff before he passed away last year. It is a gift to a person who seeks to lead a creative life to allow them to sit on stage every week and ask the best and the brightest creative people in the country how it is that they do what they do. It is, it is as if I've been in the longest MFA program ever, but I got paid to attend. Take that uppity grad school admissions jerks who didn't let me in because I didn't finish college or return my library book so I could get my transcripts. Uh, but there is another big difference, uh, um, and that is that I attended my nine-year MFA program on stage in front of 400 people, and there, as they say, was the rub. I know that you're nice people, you seem like nice people. I think there are 330 to 375 of you that I would get drunk with and make bad choices. <laughs> but as a group, your presence tripped a wire in my brain and sometimes, out of nowhere, I would be filled with spilkes. From the Yiddish, nervous energy without purpose. And I tried to ameliorate it. I tried to picture you all in your underwear, but Portland people wear so many layers of fleece that it just wasn't an option for me, ever. So this went on for months, uh, but there were so many reasons to ignore that fact, so many things that I loved about the show, so many people and ideas that I loved that I just ignored it. But then I had my gallbladder removed in January, which I've... I've talked about on the show. And at my follow-up appointment, my doctor told me that, that the gallstones were most, were most likely caused by stress, which gave me pause. You see, I, like most of you, don't have a lot of expendable organs left. And I've got an appendix, I have a spleen, I have one kidney that I think I don't need, before the spilkis starts attacking the stuff I really need, like my stomach or my heart. So I've decided to hand over the mic to someone else, and tonight and for the rest of the season, we're giving it to Luke Burbank, who has done an amazing job on our last two shows, and I'm sure we'll keep kicking ass. And as for me, I'll continue as head writer and co-producer, and you'll hear me on the show periodically, reading essays and giving the stink eye to my successor. <laughs> yes, my stink eye is so strong, you can hear it on the radio. <laughs> I'm also, I'm also going to finish that book that I've been working on for, coincidentally, nine years. 
David Rakoff said that the best gift this American life gave to him was the comma writer after his name. And I can say the same for Livewire. But I would add a thanks to everyone who's ever listened and written in. When you write about your fears and your secrets and say, hypothetically, the time you put a candy bar down your pants to keep yourself from eating it, <laughs> you do so in the hopes that someone will hear it and say, I can relate, or that's me too, or I totally did that last week with a $100,000 bar. <laughs> Most writers are hoping for proof that we're not the freak that we always thought we were. And the most important thing that you've taught me, kind and generous Livewire audience members, is that I am actually a freak. But I'm in good company because so are you. And the great thing is, if all of us are freaks, then none of us are freaks. I thank you for that lesson and for nine extraordinary years. Thank you so much for listening.